let's say we have this uniform electric field, uh, presumably caused by some charged parallel plates, maybe a positive plate on this side, negative plate on this side. But the important thing is once we have the electric field, we don't have to care about what caused it, just that there is an electric field in this region of space. And let's say we have an electric dipole here in the sense of an object that's got a, well, what do we mean by a dipole? What is an electric dipole? If we just got like some object. Yeah, positive and negative charges. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a molecule. It can be any, any object that has a positive end and a negative end counts as an electric dipole. The simplest case would just be like, you've got a, a positively charged object and a negatively charged object that are connected to each other by something. Maybe a molecular bond, maybe a, a plastic rod. Any object where you've got one end that's more positively charged and the other end that's more negatively charged. So let's say this top end is positive and this bottom end is negative. And let's assume they're the same amount of charge. So you've got charge plus Q and charge minus Q. Um, let me make that a little clearer then. Plus Q and minus Q. But the important thing is it's the same amount of charge. In that case, what's going to happen to these charged objects in the presence of this electric field? For instance, if you look at just the positively charged object for now, the positively charged object is going to experience what from the electric field? Yeah, specifically, I would say it experiences a force to the right. That doesn't necessarily mean it'll go in that direction, but there's at least a force pushing it in that direction. So there's definitely a force to the right acting on the positive charge. Specifically, our F equals Q times E. In this case, Q is positive, so F and E will be in the same direction. So F equals Q times E. And then if we take a look at just the negative charge, the negative charge is gonna experience a force opposite to the electric field. So in that case, F will be negative Q times E. And in, in the case of a vector, a vector is not negative or positive. A vector just has a direction. But taking a vector this in some direction and multiplying by a negative scalar creates a vector in the exact opposite direction. So multiplying by a negative charge means the force is in the direction exactly opposite to the electric field, in this case, to the left. So those will be the forces acting on these two ends of the dipole. Uh, however, the dipole is one big object. So what would the total force on the dipole be? Right. Zero newtons of force. The total force on the dipole is zero newtons because the positive end and the negative end are getting equal and opposite amounts of force. So this tells us that what's, what's gonna happen to the dipole? If the total force is zero, what does that tell you? Or to put it another way, if there was a non-zero total force, what happens to an object that experiences a force? Like if you just got an object and you apply a force to it, yeah, with no force, either it doesn't move or if it was already moving, it would just keep moving at the same velocity. Remember, force doesn't cause motion. Force causes a change in motion. Force causes acceleration. So no net force means that the object will not accelerate. If it's already at rest, it will continue to be at rest or if it's already moving, it'll keep moving in the same direction at the same speed, no change in velocity. So in general, a constant, a uniform electric field will not cause any translational acceleration to a dipole because all the forces cancel out. But it could cause rotational acceleration because for rotational acceleration, we wanna look at not just the forces, but also the torques. So we're gonna to have to consider the torques here. And for torque, we're gonna to need to define everything in terms of a pivot point. 
what location of this dipole do you think would make the most sense as the pivot point? If this were going to rotate around some point, what point do you think it would rotate around? Well, for a rotating object, the, I mean, for any object, the pivot point is where we measure all the distances from. Because torque is defined as distance from the pivot point times force. Uh, if the object is not rotating, you can choose any location you want as the pivot point to measure everything from. But if the object is rotating, you want to choose the location it's rotating around. So if this object, if this dipole did start to rotate, what point do you think it would start rotating around as the axis? Well, I mean, not in terms of x-axis or y-axis or z-axis, but just what point would it be, what point would be the center of the rotation? Yeah, presumably directly in the center. Uh, in fact, in general, if like if an object is attached to a hinge, the hinge itself is the pivot point. Like for instance, for the rotation of my forearm, the elbow is the pivot point. But if an object is just floating in space and spinning on its own, then it's not attached to anything. So its own center of mass would be the pivot point. So that's our pivot point here. The center of mass of the object is the pivot point. And I think we can assume that in this case, the mass is evenly distributed. So the pivot point is the exact geometric center. And then to calculate torque, uh, we would need the radius to each object. Radius in this case being the distance vector from the pivot point to the location where the force is applied. So for the top charge, the positive charge, the radius vector would be from the pivot point upwards to that center. For the negative charge, the radius vector would be from the pivot point down to the center of this other particle. So let's say the distance between them is L, then each of these would just be L over two. So if we call this distance L, then for each one of these, the radius vector would be L over two. And then from those, how would we calculate the amount of torque? How is torque usually calculated? If you think way back to 7b, torque is defined as yes radius times force. And yeah, you could write it as radius times the perpendicular component of the force or the force times the perpendicular component of the radius. Or alternatively, as force times radius times sine of the angle between them. Either way works. These are just three geometrically different ways of looking at the same thing. In this case, though, what's the angle between the radius and the force? Zero. Yeah. Sorry, what was that? Is it zero? Well, we've got radius this way and force this way. Oh. So yeah, that'll be right, 90 degrees. So we'd have radius times force times sine of 90 degrees, which is one. So in this case, that's just radius times force. So we'll have the torque on the top charge. Let's call that T plus is radius times force, so that's radius L over two times force QE. So L times Q times E over two. And then for the torque on the bottom one, let's say torque minus, that's radius times force, so L over two times Q times E. And this should be treated as magnitude of the force, so we're ignoring any positives or negatives. So that's L times Q times E over two. So both of these are experiencing the same amount of torque. 
And how would we decide direction for torque? Is this where you would need to use the right hand rule? Yeah, we can use a right hand rule for torque. Uh, specifically, the one I usually use for torque is like, let's say we're looking at the torque for the top charge. If you put your right hand at the pivot point and stretch out your fingers straight along the radius vector, so in this case, straight up, and notice that so far I can swivel my hand around while still pointing in the direction of the radius vector, but I want to swivel my hand so that I can curl my fingers in the direction of force. So radius straight up, force is pointing to the right. So swivel so you can curl your fingers to the right and your thumb should tell you the direction of the torque. So in this case, I think that'll be straight into the page or into the screen. So the torque on the positive charge is in the inwards direction. That is away from the viewer. And we would typically draw that as a circle with an exit. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, the, <laughs> the right hand rule for, or at least one of the right hand rules for torque, the one I usually use to think of it. Put your hand at the pivot point, stretch out your whole hand straight along the radius vector. So in this case, straight up, because that, that's from the pivot point towards where the force is applied. And so far, I can still swivel my hand around, but I want to swivel my hand so I can curl my fingers in the direction the force is being applied. And the force in this case, the force on the top charge is straight to the right. So swivel your hand so you can curl your fingers to the right and your thumb should tell you the direction of the force, sorry, direction of the torque. So that will be inwards. And if we try that on the lower charge, the negative charge, you can do the same thing. Put your hand at the pivot point. You wanna stretch out your fingers straight down and you wanna be able to swivel so you can curl your fingers in the direction of the force, which in this case is to the left, which means again, my thumb is pointing into the screen. So this is also a torque pointing in the inwards direction. And conceptually, the reason why they're in the same direction, the forces are in opposite directions because they're pushing in opposite directions. But in, ter in terms of the torque, if you just take some object and on the top you push to the, to the right and on the bottom you push to the left, those forces are both trying to make it rotate in the same way. So both of the, as forces they cancel out, but as torques, they're both trying to make it rotate in the same direction. So as torques, they combine, which means we can just add up these magnitudes. So this magnitude plus this magnitude, they're just gonna to combine to be an even larger total torque in the inwards direction. And we can say the, to the net torque on this object, the total torque on the dipole, LQE over two plus LQE over two is just L times two times E. So that's the total torque acting on the object. Any questions on that so far? Hey, sorry. So how did you, um, once you did the right hand rule, I guess, what does that mean for the equation? What does that mean for what? Or what do you do once after you do the right hand rule, I guess? Hmm. Well, we're to find the net torque, we're adding together the vectors. Net torque is uh, the torque on the positive charge plus the torque on the negative charge. So what that means is that all right, we're, if we're just adding these as vectors, we've got a vector pointing into the screen plus another vector pointing into the screen. If we're adding two vectors that are in the same direction, would their values combine or cancel out? If they're in the same direction, they would combine? Yeah, so that means we can just add their magnitudes. This is basically the one and only situation where when you're adding vectors, you can just add their magnitudes together if they're in exactly the same direction. You could also think of this in terms of components. In this case, we uh, this is a three-dimensional situation. So we'd have three components, X component, Y component, Z component. <clears throat> we could say each one of these is zero in the X direction, zero in the Y direction, and LQE over two in the Z direction. 
where let's say the positive Z direction is into the screen. And then we're adding another vector that's also 0, 0, LQE over 2. So if we add the X components, they add up to 0. Add the Y components, they add up to 0. Add the Z components, they add up to LQE. So the net torque is 0, 0, LQE. Or we can just say magnitude LQE in the inwards direction, which as before, we would draw as a circle with an X in it. And in terms of what that actually does, what happens to an object if the torque on it is non-zero? Uh, there isn't really a numerical angle for this. I would just say in the inwards direction. So what, what does that actually do? If you have an object and you apply a torque to it, what happens to the object? Yeah, it spins. Or more, more, more specifically, I would say it rotationally accelerates. If it's not already rotating, it starts rotating. If it is already rotating, the torque makes it change its rotation. In the same way that a force causes a change in translational motion, a torque causes a change in rotational motion. It causes rotational acceleration. So if this is not already spinning, it's going to start spinning. If it's already spinning, then it's going to spin faster or slower, depending on the direction. But this is going to make it start to rotate in a direction. So like a little bit later, it's going to be spinning this way. So let's say something like this. with the positive side and the negative side. So this is what it would look like a little bit later. It will have spun a little bit in that direction. <clears throat> Any questions on that so far? Wait, hold on. So I'm kind of confused about what that last like diagram you just drew. Is it like rotating? Like, how is it rotating again? Or like, uh, like accelerating? Or uh, like this? You push on the object like this, and it starts to spin. Oh. So it's going to spin, and since it's a, it, it's a continuing to experience a torque, it's going to spin faster and faster. Oh, interesting. Thank you. I'm just putting it off to the side to make it easier to see, rather than cluttering up the diagram. Thank you, Casey. Mm -hmm. But remember, this is not moving translationally. This is basically just staying still, but spinning in place and spinning faster and faster because it's experiencing a torque. However, at this point, if we take a look at the forces again, the forces are still directly to the right for the positive charge and directly to the left for the negative charge. However, the moment arm vectors are now going to be different. If we draw in the moment arm vectors, from the center to the location of the force, from the center to the location of the force, is still the same distance and still the same force, but what is different now? Would the blue vector and the pink vector like add up? Well, we're not adding those. Remember, the torque was calculated as force times radius times sine of the angle between them. It's still the same radius, it's still the same force, but what has changed? Well, they are vectors. The, the blue arrow here is the radius vector, the moment arm vector, and the pink arrow here is the force vector. So they are vectors. We just can't really add them because they're measuring different things. The radius vector is measuring a distance. The force arrow is measuring an amount of force. And you can't add meters plus newtons. But you can multiply them. Torque is force times radius times sine of the angle between them. We've got the same radius because we haven't changed the size of the dipole. We've got the same force because we haven't changed Q or E. But we've rotated it. So that means the direction has changed. If you take a look at, and for direction, I find it useful to imagine extending the line of the radius if necessary. 
And we're talking about the force between that extension of the radius and the force vector. So this angle is no longer a right angle. Previously, they were perpendicular, but it's no longer a right angle. So that means instead of just having F times R times sine 90, which is one, we now have F times R times sine of whatever this new angle is. So at this point, the torque is gonna to be force times radius times something less than one. So there's still a torque, but it's gonna be weaker. Specifically, that new torque is gonna to be L times Q times E times sine theta or over two times sine theta. Uh, and well, theta is just gonna be however far it's rotated. At the beginning, it was 90 degrees because there hadn't been any rotation yet. But now there's been some rotation, so theta is gonna be smaller than 90 degrees. But generally, theta is gonna be whatever angle the, the bar itself makes with the electric field. Like in the original situation, the dipole was perpendicular to the electric field. But now the dipole is not perpendicular. It's got a smaller angle. But generally, whatever angle the dipole itself makes with the electric field is the same as the angle the radius makes with the force. So whatever that angle is, that'll be the angle in the formula. Any other questions on that so far? Hi, Casey. So um, we, in DL, if I remember correctly today, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Ryan, my TA was, uh, he was like calculating the theta given like, uh, finding like the magnitude for the electric field at a certain particle. And I was just kind of like confused about that. Hmm. I think that's yeah. a different situation. We could go over an example of that next also. In this case though, theta isn't really something to calculate though. Theta is just how far the, the dipole has rotated so far. Or not exactly how far it's rotated so far. It's just the angle the dipole makes with the electric field vector. Like if the dipole is perpendicular to the electric field, in the, like in the initial situation, you had the dipole vertical and the electric field horizontal. So the angle is 90 degrees. Once the dipole has rotated, the dipole is now at a smaller angle to the electric field. So theta will be some smaller angle. And so we still have uh, Q times E as the force, but the torque will be L over two, the distance times Q times E, the force, times sine of whatever the angle is. <clears throat> then the other one, we'd have another copy of LQE over two times sine theta. So we'd add those and get a net torque of L times Q times E over two. No, the over twos cancel out because we're writing together times sine theta. It's just that in the original situation, theta was 90 degrees and sine of 90 is one. But generally, the net torque is going to be L times Q times E times sine theta. And I think an important thing to see in this formula here, we can sort of split this out into the L times Q, the distance times the charge. That's a property of the dipole itself. That's the charge of each end of the dipole because we're assuming they're the same amount of charge. So the charge of one end of the dipole times the distance between them, L, that's a property of the dipole. And then electric field is just a property of the location in space. And then also times sine theta, which is describing how they're related to each other. And that L times Q being the uh, description of properties of the dipole, this we generally call the dipole moment vector the dipole moment. So distance times charge is the dipole moment. Basically a description of how much of a dipole it is. So a large dipole moment could mean, for instance, a large positive charge, a large negative charge that are far apart but attached to each other. Whereas a small dipole moment would mean maybe a weak positive charge, weak negative charge, and attached close together. <clears throat> 
But generally, the larger the dipole moment is, the more torque you get from the electric field. In general, any dipole can experience a torque from an electric field. But the more the larger the dipole moment is, the more torque you get. And the stronger the electric field is, the more torque you get. And also, the angle plays a role as well. You get the most torque if the angle is 90 degrees. You get no torque at all if the angle is 0 or 180. But generally, the dipole moment is distance times charge. And it's also considered a vector in the sense that direction matters. The dipole moment is specifically a vector pointing in the direction of the orientation of the dipole, specifically from the negative end to the positive end. So if the dipole rotates, the dipole moment vector is now pointing a new direction. Any questions on that so far? This also means if you just got some object, like let's say you have some weird shaped lumpy object, but it has some charge. Let's say it has uh, some positive charge on one side and some negative charge on the other side. Let's say up here, it's got a bunch of positive charge. And then down here, it's got a bunch of negative charge. Uh, let's say same amount. So something like this. If you've got a positive end and a negative end, the dipole moment will be a vector pointing from the positive end towards the negative end. And its size, its magnitude will be equal to the charge times the distance between them. So whatever this distance is times the charge of one end, presumably the charge of the positive end because it's absolute value. And the whole point of the dipole moment is really two things. First of all, to keep track of how much of a dipole it is in terms of distance times charge. And second, since it's a vector, to keep track of the orientation of the dipole. So if the dipole was rotating, then the dipole moment vector would be changing direction. And that way, this sine theta here is just the angle between the dipole moment vector and the electric field vector. So if the dipole moment vector and the electric field vector are in the same direction or exact opposite directions, you get no torque at all. If they're perpendicular, you get lots of torque. Any other questions on that dipole moment idea? Um, I had a question. So uh, I started working on the FNT and um, it was asking about how the chemical bonds can bend. And then uh, I guess like it asks, if the molecule is polar. So mm -hmm. for that, would that just be referring to their to their being a or like they have different charges, I guess? Well, let's say you have something like uh, let's say carbon dioxide. In a carbon dioxide molecule, you've got uh, let's say the carbon atom in the, in the middle and oxygen atoms attached to it. So let's say something like this. Uh, what we got, yeah, so we got oxygen, carbon, oxygen. And yeah, let's fill in that the color so we can see them a little more easily. Carbon. And let's say oxygen and oxygen. Uh, and those are attached with bonds. 
I think double bonds if we want to make this really accurate. And it's a linear molecule. Also, the charges are kind of unevenly distributed. Uh, does this tell you anything about where the charges are? Um, well, I guess in, so the two oxygens should have the same charge. In this problem, they told us that they both um, partial negatives at O, and then um, at C, it had a plus two charge. Yeah, that the oxygens each have an extra electron, I think. Mm -hmm. And then the carbon is missing two electrons. So the carbon has a positive charge. And the oxygens each have a negative charge. So does this count as a dipole? Does it have a positive end and a negative end? Yes. Which end would you say is positive and which end would you say is negative? Um. Yeah, the positive is the still. carbon is positive, but the carbon isn't really an end of it. Like if we just draw a line through the center, can you say one end is more positive or one half is more positive and one half is more negative? No. Right. Any line I draw through the center, uh, no matter how I draw that line, we can't really divide this into a positive half and a negative half. Like if I draw a line like this, this half is a little more negative and this half is also a little more negative. We still have complete symmetry. There's no way to draw a line through the center that splits it into a positive side and a negative side. Uh, not really one of the, I mean, both of the oxygens are negatively charged. So we can't really say one of the oxygens is more positive than the other or more negative than the other. So this molecule as it currently stands is not actually a dipole at all because of that symmetry. You can also think of it, if you imagine it as two dipoles linked together, if you think of the dipole as a vector pointing from the negative end to the positive end, you could think of it as this dipole from negative to positive and this dipole from negative to positive. But to get the total dipole moment of the, of the molecule, you would add those together. And what do you get if you add these vectors together? Zero. Right. The dipole, the individual dipole moment contributions cancel out. So this vector's total dipole moment is zero, meaning, or this molecule's total dipole moment is zero, meaning it doesn't actually count as a dipole. However, that doesn't mean that nothing happens if we put this in an electric field. Let's say we do put this in an electric field. Charges. And we know that these individual objects are gonna experience forces. Specifically, we would get uh, the negative charges experience a force opposite to the electric field. The positive charge experiences a force in the direction of the electric field and twice as strong because it's got twice as much charge. As forces, they add it to zero because we've got positive two or two in this direction and one and one in this direction. So the forces add up to zero. As torques though, they also add up to zero because the, the, the force on the carbon atom doesn't provide any torque since it's at the pivot point. The forces on the oxygen atoms are pushing, like one of them is trying to make it rotate this way, the other tries to make it rotate this way. So as torques, they also cancel out. We get zero total torque, which also tells you this is not a dipole. The electric field isn't trying to make it rotate in a particular direction, so it's not a dipole. But that doesn't mean nothing happens. Because remember back in 7a, we were treating the molecular bonds as basically like tiny springs. If you have three objects connected by springs and you push the center one way while pushing the other two the other way, what's going to happen to those springs? Will nothing happen? Does it? Cancel out. The springs aren't perfectly rigid though. Springs can bend. So this molecule, even though it's not gonna get any rotation or translational acceleration, it can still have some bending. Uh, what do you mean by elaborate the Q here? You mean charge or question? Charge. 
Okay. Uh, in, the, in the sense of what's going to happen if you've got three objects connected by springs, and let's say you push the middle to the right and you push the top and bottom to the left. Yeah, it's going to wiggle around. Specifically, you're going to get some bending. The carbon atom you're pushing to the right, the oxygen atoms you're pushing to the left. And so what you end up with is the bonds themselves are going to bend. I think I'm just going to have to redraw the bonds. Zoom was programmed by somebody who doesn't know how to make a graphic design program at all. But the bonds end up bent. And this might be something of an exaggeration. I don't think the bonds actually bend quite this much. Uh, well, carbon dioxide on its own is a straight line. It's a linear molecule. But in the presence of an electric field, it becomes bent. And that bend, if we now try drawing in a line through the middle, specifically, if we just draw a line straight through the middle, straight up and down, what do you notice about the right half of the molecule versus the left half of the molecule? Yeah, this is now a dipole. The right half of this line I just drew in is a definitely positive side, and the left half is a definitely negative side. It's a fairly weak dipole because there's not all that much separation between the positive and negative ends, but it is a dipole. Specifically, if we now draw in those dipole moment contribution vectors from negative to positive, from negative to positive, and we add those together, head to tail as usual for vectors, we now have a non-zero sum. The total dipole moment is this horizontal vector. So this does count as a dipole because it's no longer perfectly symmetric in the way it was before. So this is one example of a molecule that in itself is not a dipole, but becomes a dipole in the presence of a strong electric field because the molecule can bend, the molecular bonds can bend. And so this is this would be called a polarizable molecule. In its own in its own right, it is not polar, but it becomes polar. So it is polarizable. Any other questions on the dipole stuff? <clears throat> so right. All right, so then if you were to, I guess, um, look at the equation for the dipole moment, so now basically there is one, and it'll be mm -hmm. pointing up like that? Uh, for the carbon dioxide molecule? Yeah, now that it's bent. At this point, the dipole moment would be a vector pointing to the right, because it's from the, from the negative side towards the positive side. Okay. And to calculate it formally, what you would do is you'd, you'd look at the individual charges. Like this negative and positive, you can calculate a dipole moment vector for just one negative charge on the oxygen and one negative charge on the carbon. You can also calculate a dipole moment vector for the negative charge on the other oxygen to the other positive charge on the carbon. So you can calculate two dipole moment contributions and then add those together head to tail or just as vector addition to get the total dipole moment of the vector of the molecule. Okay, that makes sense. Any other questions on dipoles or anything else you'd like to work on? Um, I had a question about the um, finding the theta according to magnitudes given for like electric field uh, right. at a particle, yeah. Thank you. And this was, was this the one with the, uh, uh, let me see the screen show this. Okay, so was this the one with the equilateral triangle? Mm 
Yeah, that one. So in that one, you had the three charges on the corners of an equilateral triangle. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Let's say A, B, and C. And what were you trying to find in that one? Or what was your goal? Or what, what are you trying to figure out in this in this triangle? Yeah, the electric field vector at, and I would say at each location rather than at each particle, because an electric field is a property of a location in space, whether there's a particle there or not. So for example, if we're trying to find the electric field at let's say location C, <clears throat> in that case, what I would do there is I would think of location C as just an empty point in space for now. So ignore the charge that's there and just treat this as an empty point in space. So we've got char uh, source charge A, source charge in the sense that we're thinking of this as something creating an electric field, and source charge B. And then we're just going to call this location C in the sense that we're just treating it as an empty point in space, ignoring the charge that's at that location, because C is not exerting an electric field on itself. Uh, for that, we need to figure out the electric field that each one of the source charges creates at that location. So for instance, charge B is going to create electric field in which direction? Uh, we were assuming these were positive, right? And positive QA. And positive QB. Yeah, I think it gave us uh, C was a negative value. But since we're treating C as just an empty point in space for now, we can ignore that. And we can just fill in that value later if needed. So we've got two positive source charges, and they're going to create electric field at, I mean, really electric field everywhere around them, but we care about location C. So looking at just charge B, that's going to create electric field at location C in which direction? In general, what direction do you expect a positive charge's electric field to be? Yeah, outwards. Positive source charge is going to create outwards electric field in all directions. <clears throat> what we care about is location C. So at location C, which direction would count as away from charge B? Like up, down, left, right, some diagonal, or what? Like if I could just make a vector in any direction, which direction would count as outwards? Yeah, to the right. So to the right would be the electric field contribution from B. So we call this uh, electric field contribution from B, let's say E sub B. And we can use the usual formula KQB over R squared as the magnitude there. And that should be interpreted as absolute value of the charge because we're just looking for magnitude here. And likewise, charge A is going to create electric field in which direction? What would count as outwards from charge A if we're at location C? Yeah, down and to the right, specifically along that same line of the triangle. And that should be magnitude uh, EA, that is the electric field contribution from charge A, would be K times QA over R squared. 
possibly a different charge with the same radius, same distance. And EB is entirely in the X direction. So we can write that as just uh, this value in the X direction, comma, zero in the Y direction. As for A though, we're gonna to need to split it into components. So to look at those components, uh, let me take the B off to the side because we don't wanna get the diagram too cluttered up. For A, we can split the contribution up into its components, uh, presumably an X component and a Y component. Do we know any of the angles in this triangle? Yeah, because if we go back to the original equilateral triangle of distances, all those angles are 60 degrees because it's equilateral. And these two angles are what in geometry would be called vertical angles directly across based on these continuations of the same lines. So that's also gonna be 60 degrees. So you can find the other sides of this triangle using sine and cosine of 60. The adjacent side should be uh, EA cosine 60 and the opposite will be EA sine 60. So EA times cosine 60 degrees and EA times sine 60 degrees. Uh, oh yeah, moving that to the left. How's that look? <clears throat> and then we can fill in the usual values for those. Uh, cosine 60 should just be one half. And sine 60 is EA or uh, root three over two. Also, since this is downwards, that's a negative y direction, so we should manually insert a negative there. So that's what we can use for EA. EA is, let me put this in the, the color. So EA written in terms of its components could be written as magnitude over two for the X component and negative magnitude times root three over two for the Y component. And the magnitude itself is KQA times R squared or over R squared. So if we replace EA with KQA over R squared, and the R squared can be bundled into the denominator. And likewise, EA is KQA over R squared and the R squared goes into the denominator. So we now have X and Y components for EA and EB is just an X component and then zero for the Y component. So we can now add those together, X component plus X component, Y component plus Y component, to get the total electric field at location C in terms of X and Y components. Then once you've got the electric field at location C, you can multiply that electric field vector by whatever the charge of object C is to get the force on object C. Any other questions on that? So we apply the same concept to, okay, wait. What would be the angles for for B and A? Because I feel like 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 the angle is pretty hard for me to like. Kind of. Uh, if you're talking that. about at location A. Yeah, and at location B as well. Like at location A, for, I think at location B you're going to get complete symmetry there. Uh, at location A though, we'd have, for instance. Oh, it's covered in white. The the A. What? I don't know if you see it, but like, for me on my end like the a particle is like it just it's just a white like blank yeah. there yeah i'm, I'm uh, covering that up because it, at this point we're now treating charge a as just a location and oh i see, I see. so this is now location a and then we'd be treating a and b as these or b and c as these source charges 
So if we're treating location A as an empty point in space and treating B and C, and I think we were treating C as a negative charge. So that means we'd have electric field pointing outwards from B. and towards C. So for the angle, we usually define angles in terms of the angle it makes with horizontal. So for A, we'd have, or sorry, for electric field contribution from B, we wanna look at the angle that this vector makes with B horizontal. So what would that vector have to be? Would that also be 60 from the horizontal? Yeah, and we can justify that geometrically by looking at parallel lines. We've got this line that cuts through a horizontal and another horizontal. Horizontal lines are parallel to other horizontal lines. So oh, that means that I see. this yeah, angle, yeah. Oh my God. yeah, same as this angle. Oh, yeah, I ultimately, ang finding angles like this is usually all about uh, lines crossing two parallel lines or angles that add up to a triangle. So if, if you have triangles or if you have parallel lines, use those. If not, it's usually a good idea to try extending the lines you already have to make parallel lines and a third line that meets both of them or to make complete triangles. Thank you so much, Casey. You're welcome. Have a good day. Thanks. Thanks. You too. Bye. See you next time.